Welcome fellow aviators and welcome back to part two in this series. My name is Greg and today's video will cover stalls and stall recovery. Why cover stalls in a video about landing? Because to put it simply, you don't want to be this guy. Unlike this character, we're not stuck in someone else's story, doomed to make the same mistakes over and over. We can write our own narrative based on what we know about wings and how they work. We do have to respect their limits or envelope beyond which they simply will not fly. In this regard, the physics of flight is unforgiving. And unlike Wiley, we won't have the luxury of pondering our mistakes before plummeting to earth. This cross-section of a wing in flight shows the normal flow of air over a wing. I drew it with a slight nose-up attitude to illustrate what a wing on the downwind leg of the landing pattern might look like. This is approximately the attitude of my Avanti in 1G level flight at 30 knots. Even with flaps up, it's safe from stalling. Or is it? What would happen if I let my plane get too slow on downwind while maintaining this attitude? That can happen easily with a large tailwind, when high ground speed can be mistaken for high airspeed. Maintaining even a nose level attitude without sufficient airspeed can lead to a stall. So what is a stall, and how does it happen? An aerodynamic stall is a sudden loss of lift that occurs when a wing exceeds its critical angle of attack. Beyond this angle, airflow no longer follows the upper surface of the wing. Instead, it separates into turbulent eddies and backflow. This separation begins at the trailing edge of the wing and moves forward as the angle of attack increases. The transition from smooth, attached airflow to detached, swirling air is felt inside full-scale airplanes as buffeting. You can see that same buffeting shake the wings on my Avanti as it approaches its critical angle of attack. The critical angle of attack, or AOA, is different for each wing, but in the full-scale world, it will be somewhere between 15 and 22 degrees. For some RC airplanes, it may be higher. It's also important to note that there's not just one critical angle of attack for a particular wing. Leading edge slats will increase the critical angle of attack. That's good. But flaps will lower the critical AOA. That might sound bad, reducing the wing's flight envelope, but it serves a good purpose, allowing the root of the wing to stall before the outer wing, where the ailerons are located. This gives the pilot time to recover before losing control over the roll axis. The Avanti has split flaps. They can lower the critical AOA by as much as five degrees, depending on the amount of deflection. See NACA report 668, link is in the description. The key point to remember is that stalls can happen at any attitude or airspeed. A plane could be in a high-speed dive, pulling out of a dive, flying straight and level, pulling up from a high-speed pass, in slow flight with nose high, rocketing straight up, or in a high-speed turn. AOA is the only factor that determines when a stall will occur. Watch this Air Berlin RC A330 on the base leg of its approach. A link to the full flight is in the description. Were you surprised at the stall? Or did you see it coming? When initiating the turn to base, or any bank turn, adding throttle should be automatic. An exception to this would be if you're too high when turning to base or final and need to descend quickly. In that case, you would lower the nose during the turn. Lowering the nose alone might be sufficient to maintain airspeed, depending on the airframe's drag coefficient. Making a level turn without adding power, though, will slow any plane down, and more importantly, quickly bring the wings closer to the critical angle of attack. Even with a fairly nose level attitude and minimum bank angle, it's possible to exceed the critical angle of attack and stall. You have to react instantly with nose down and power up to have any chance of a recovery. If you haven't practiced stall recovery, your first instinct might be to pull up in a panic as you see the plane plummet towards the ground. If you do that, it's game over. Oddly enough, most full-scale light aircraft are not equipped with nor required to have an AOA sensor. They just have airspeed and a stall horn 
to let the pilot know the plane is close to a stall. Commercial airliners and military aircraft do have an AOA sensor. Here's what one looks like in an F-18. An AOA indicator provides the pilot with the most accurate picture of the stall margin, that is, how close the wing is to its critical angle of attack. I'll have more on this when I cover glide slope control in part five. We don't have a stall horn or AOA sensor on our model planes, so for most of us, our only cue is visual. Here's an experimental AOA indicator in video made by Sam Shepard, which is fascinating to watch. He describes how he made it earlier in the video. I'll leave a link to it in the description. The type of stalls we're concerned with here are the ones most likely to occur any time we're low and slow in the landing pattern. Those are power on, power off, accelerated, and cross-controlled stalls. There's probably zero chance of recovery from a secondary stall while landing, as there simply won't be enough altitude. As the name implies, a secondary stall happens during the recovery from an initial stall. It takes practice and quick reflexes to recover from any initial stall while low and slow, so the best practice is to recover before the stall can fully develop. To do that, we need to understand when these stalls happen and recognize their warning signs. A power-on stall at takeoff, during a touch-and-go, or on a go-round, typically happens as a result of an incorrect trim setting, perhaps left in from an approach to land, or when a flap to elevator mix is not set up, or is insufficient once power is added. The aircraft climbs too steeply for the power setting and begins to lose airspeed. There's usually some warning before the stall that may not be as benign as this one. A power off stall happens when power is close to idle and the nose attitude is too high for the airspeed. Watch the telltale streamers to see the moment when laminar airflow separates from the wing into turbulent eddies. An accelerated stall is a bit more sudden with little to no warning, as we saw with this A330 Air Berlin airliner. Acceleration here refers to any G loading on the wing above 1G level flight. This additional G-loading occurs any time an airplane is in a banked turn and back pressure is applied to the stick, either to maintain level flight or increase the rate of turn. More on this in a minute. Another common accelerated stall happens when pulling too quickly on the elevator, and that can happen at takeoff or during a go-around. An accelerated stall combined with rudder input is a common aerobatic maneuver in IMAC, known as a snap roll. Before moving on to the warning signs of a stall and the steps for recovery, I need to emphasize an important point. You cannot fly your way out of a stall. For recovery to happen, it's critical to recognize the stall first, then unload the wings. That's not as easy as you might think, especially for an accelerated stall when it happens so unexpectedly and well above the 1G stall speed. Reacting to a wing drop with opposite aileron or to a downward pitching nose by pulling back on the elevator will only deepen an accelerated stall. Recognizing an unexpected accelerated stall can be really hard, and failure to do so can cost you an airplane. I almost lost my iMac plane, an 89-inch Extra 330, when it went into an accelerated stall. I didn't recognize the stall and tried to fly my way out of it. The plane was still new. It was only flight number 52. Here's a rough simulation of that incident. My iMac mentor, Ray, called for a 270-degree aerobatic turn. I was flying a bit close to the runway when I initiated the turn, and when I rolled out, I was heading straight for the deadline. To avoid crossing it, I immediately pulled back on the stick to do an Immelman, but I pulled so fast the plane went into an accelerated stall. Time immediately slowed down as I fought to regain control, but nothing I did was helping. When I realized I couldn't recover, I made my peace with fate, said my goodbyes, and let go of the stick. At that moment, the plane stopped rolling. I saw the top of the wings against the early morning sun and pulled up just inches before hitting the ground. That was close. Fly it to the crash? That's exactly what would have happened had I not let go. That plane went on to compete in many IMAC contests, including the 2018 Nats at Muncie, and win two regional championships two years in a row. It now has over 800 flights on it. 
Only two years later, I got into another accelerated stall at a Funfly event with a different iMac plane, my 104-inch Extra 300. FreeSky dropped the ball on their firmware update to fix USM events, or uncommanded servo movements. Their procedure for the update left out a critical step to rebind the receiver, so my radio was still vulnerable in a crowded frequency environment. After careful review of the telemetry data from flight number 220, I found an uncommanded servo movement had initiated an accelerated stall during a high-speed, low-altitude knife-edge pass. The plane was instantly rolling uncontrollably, and I had only three seconds before impact to assess what happened and recover. That never happened, because I didn't recognize the stall and tried to fly my way out of it. So, giving up is not exactly the lesson I want to impart here, but letting go of the stick may save your plane. Recognizing an accelerated stall when it happens may give you that extra second or two to initiate a stall recovery. If you pull too soon or too hard during the recovery from a stall, you can get into a secondary stall, which may be worse than the initial stall. I almost lost my Avanti doing this and captured it with my onboard camera. I'll leave a link to that in the description. This Spitfire video better illustrates just how much altitude may be lost when this happens. Pull out of it! Pull out of it! Oh no! The final type of stall that's a major concern here is the cross-controlled stall. Any type of uncoordinated turn is potentially dangerous in the landing pattern, although I have seen many pilots, from beginner to expert, successfully pull off a rudder-only skidding turn outside of the pattern. Consider the following scenario. You're turning from base to final and overshoot the center line. This can happen if you're too close on the downwind leg when the wind is down the runway, or when a strong crosswind is also a tailwind on base. This citation, turning onto final at Telluride, Colorado, is moments away from a fatal cross-controlled stall and crash. Fortunately, this is just a simulation. We'll come back to it in a moment. The one crash I had with my Avanti could have been due to cross-control inputs if I had left them in just a moment longer. I didn't even realize I had them in there until I reviewed the data from telemetry. One more reason not to fly when you're tired. The roll was instantaneous, like a snap roll, most likely aided by a strong crosswind and a failure to correct for it. It happened just after throttling up from a touch and go so the damage was limited to a broken vertical stab. But cross-controlling could have happened just as easily here when overshooting final due to a strong crosswind. Notice the runway in the upper left corner. It's better to accept a go-around than do what our imaginary citation pilot is about to do next. Our sim pilot is turning onto final and realizes he's overshot the center line. He's already at 30 degrees of bank and doesn't want to steepen it anymore, so he kicks in left rudder to tighten the turn. As the plane yaws to the left, lift decreases on the left wing and increases on the right. The plane begins to roll into the turn, steepening the left bank, so the pilot counters that automatically with right aileron. As the left aileron goes down, it increases the angle of attack, just enough to push the AOA on that side beyond the critical angle of attack. The left wing stalls, and instead of rolling to the right as commanded, it now does the opposite. The pilot tries to recover, but it's too late. The asymmetric stall is violent and fast. The plane immediately rolls left and enters into a spin. There is no recovery. Here's an actual citation overshooting final at the same airport in winter. Unlike our sim pilot, he managed to land safely by taking his time to get back Zero, on center one, two, line. The aerodynamics of an asymmetric stall are the same for an RC model. Garage RC captured this beautifully during this unfortunate crash of an AL-37. Watch the right aileron. You can see the wing initially responds correctly to left aileron input, but as the loading on the wing increases, notice the wings bending upwards. The wing approaches its critical angle of attack. The down aileron pushes the wing beyond its critical angle and into a stall, and the wing suddenly reverses direction. When low and slow, it is very difficult to recover from a stall, so knowing when your plane is about to stall is absolutely critical. 
Here are some visual cues and warning signs to look for. An AOA sensor would be great, but the next best thing is watching the combination of pitch attitude, airspeed, and track. Basically, the nose needs to point in the direction of flight. The larger the difference, the larger the AOA. If you are slow and the nose is level or pointing anywhere above the horizon while descending, you're probably close to a stall. Maintaining a good pitch attitude for given airspeed is the key to a safe approach. Remember that flaps change the cord line, so lowering the flaps increases the current AOA if the pitch attitude and track remain the same. Higher AOA and an increase in camber both create more lift, which is why aircraft balloon upwards unless down trim is applied. In full-scale aviation, this fact allows a pilot to lower the nose on approach more than he or she could do without flaps, increasing forward visibility. This also means we can lower the nose when we lower the flaps without increasing airspeed, reducing our AOA and increasing our stall margin. Conversely, keeping the nose level or slightly up after lowering flaps may not be appropriate and could lead to a stall. Having an airspeed sensor can really help dial in the correct pitch attitude for a given model, since pitch controls speed and slow flight. Coordinated flight and use of the rudder rather than ailerons to lift a drooping wing can also save the day, but best practice is to avoid letting the nose get too high when slow or letting the airspeed get too low when the nose is high. Having a separate trim setting for landing will help avoid trouble. There are plenty of exceptions, of course, to keeping your nose low. Delta wings and 3D pilots with 3D planes and plenty of power love high alpha and post stall tricks. A decrease in control effectiveness. This is another reason not to have too much expo, so you can recognize when this change happens. Just be aware that on a hot, muggy day, when density altitude is high, your controls will feel sluggish compared to a cool day with less humidity. Unexpected loss of altitude will accompany a loss of lift. If the plane gets too slow, and you're lucky enough to catch this before the stall gets too deep, it's possible to recover. When I was trying different trim settings to get the right approach speed, I got too slow on base and my Avanti started falling out of the sky. I was able to catch it by throttling up instantly. A heavier jet, or a turbine, would not recover so quickly, if at all. Buffeting will precede a stall. This may be hard to spot, except on a calm day. If you add an airspeed sensor and your radio has haptic feedback, you can program a stick shaker to mimic the shaking on board. Then you'll have a visceral warning of an impending knots. stall. 25 knots. 24 knots. Stall. 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 Just one second of that vibration is enough to get my attention. The ideal when landing is to get the airspeed slow enough to touch down with minimal wear and tear on tires and landing gear, and to minimize stress on the airframe. We also want to avoid going off the end of the runway, which can really do some damage. So the closer we are to stall speed at touchdown, the better, and the lower our stall speed is, the better. That reduces our overall energy state, which is really the key to a safe landing. We can lower stall speed with flaps. That's not our only option. Some of the things that affect stall speed are physical condition of the aircraft. Any change to an airframe that disrupts the flow of air contributing to lift can increase stall speed, especially any change to the leading edge or surface of the wing. Weight and balance. Weight is obvious as it directly affects how much lift and thus speed must be generated to maintain flight so any increase in weight will increase stall speed. CG may not be so obvious, since any change here does not by itself change the weight of the plane. But notice that as CG moves forward, a larger downward force must be generated by the horizontal stab to maintain balance in flight. The net change is a vector opposite to lift, so it has the same effect as adding weight to the plane, increasing stall speed. Conversely, moving the CG back decreases the force needed on the tail, so stall speed will decrease. Angle of bank. 
more on this in a minute, but the brief on this is that stall speed increases with angle of bank, and it's not linear, so sticking to 30 degrees or less is best. Flaps. Lowering flaps increases the camber of the wing, changing the wing's coefficient of lift in a positive direction. That increases lift and lowers stall speed. How much it affects stall speed will depend on the type of flaps. The split flaps on the Avanti only decrease stall speed by a couple knots when fully deployed. But they increase lift and generate a lot of drag, which allows a steeper approach and helps to slow the plane down for landing. As I mentioned earlier, the effect bank angle has on stall speed is nonlinear, so we really have to pay attention to how steeply we bank during turns in the landing pattern. This graph shows both the increase in stall speed and the load factor, or G-load, on the wings as bank angle increases in a level turn. There's a dramatic increase in both as the bank angle exceeds 60 degrees. So let's take my Avanti as an example. It stalls at 15 knots with flaps down, gear out, and zero bank angle. At 30 degrees, there's a 7% increase in stall speed to 16 knots, and the load factor increases to 1.2 Gs. No problem. At 45 degrees, there's a 19% increase to 18 knots and 1.4 Gs. That's getting my attention. At 60 degrees, there's a 41% increase to 21 knots and 2 Gs. Now that's getting dangerous. It's as if my Avanti took off weighing double its normal weight, or more than 13 pounds. It only gets worse from there. So any bank angle above 30 degrees really starts to reduce the safety margin that separates a good day from a bad one. Anytime you bank beyond 30 degrees in the landing pattern, an alarm should start sounding in your head. If you do stall, don't be that guy who blames it on your radio. Bank angle. Bank angle. Bank angle. Stall. Stall. What happened? My radio. It just stopped working. To recover from a stall, you must get the nose down immediately. The wings will not fly again until they are unloaded. You cannot fly your way out of a stall. Once the airflow has separated to the point of a stall, it will feel like you have lost radio control of the plane. Any aileron input will be ineffective, or worse, have the opposite effect. Pulling back on the stick to avoid hitting the ground will just deepen the stall. You have to lower the nose to get the wings flying again. You have to add power to get the airspeed back up. And you have to level the wings before you can pull up. That's a lot that has to happen in the blink of an eye, or the plane will hit the ground before you realize what happened. So, practice stall recovery at a safe altitude as often as you can until it becomes automatic. Push the nose down, power up if you're slow, level the wings, then pull up. Push, power, level, pull. Once you understand what causes a stall and how to avoid and recover from them, you can have fun pushing your plane a bit closer to the edge, as seen here. Will this stall and fall, crash and burn, or land safely? It's impossible to tell from just the bank angle, shown here at 45 degrees. The runway is visible in the upper right corner. A few moments earlier, it was at 55 degrees. If you were the pilot paying attention to the airspeed, track, and how hard you're pulling back on the stick, you would have a good clue as to the current AOA. By keeping the wings lightly loaded, allowing the plane to descend in the turn with the nose down, it's possible to get away with this excessive bank angle. The approach and landing is one of the most challenging phases of flight for both model and full-scale aircraft. Loss of control from a stall is a risk we all face during flight. That risk is highest any time we're in the landing pattern, and it should be forefront in our minds. At a bare minimum, a good landing is no accident. That means it is an intentional outcome, one based on an understanding of the limits of flight, as well as a path to a successful outcome. That path will be the focus for the remainder of this series. That's it for now. In part three, I'll take a quick dive into the physics of slow flight, where we'll be on the backside of the power curve, close to a stall, all the way to touchdown. 
Until then, keep your wings in the air and your troubles on the ground. And oh yeah, grease one on for me.